Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Summer Veggie Planting Webinar presented by the CFAS Alumni Society Board. I am Bailey Eberhardt, and I serve as the 2020 to 2021 Academic Year Representative on the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences Alumni Society Board of Directors. Uh, the CFAS Alumni Society Board represents the voice of all CFAS alumni and serves as a resource for relations between college alumni and the University Alumni Association. The fellowship committee, which I sit on, works to bring engaging events such as this webinar to the larger CFAS community. Uh, before we begin our webinar today, I wanted to share a few housekeeping items. Uh, all microphones are muted and videos are turned off. Uh, the session is being recorded and we'll share that after the webinar. And then if you would like to ask any questions to our speaker, speaker Dr. McDermott, please use the chat feature below to submit those questions throughout the webinar. With that being said, I'm thrilled to introduce an outstanding OSU alumnus and speaker of our webinar today. Dr. Tim McDermott has been an agriculture and natural service, uh, or sorry, and natural resource extension educator within the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences for the past eight years with, uh, and that was after 20, 20 years in private practice, veterinary medicine and surgery. He assists client resident backyard growers, community gardeners, teachers, educators, and urban farmers to increase the production of fresh local produce through his work in local food production systems in Franklin County. He utilizes his veterinary expertise for extension work in backyard poultry, small ruminant, insect vector disease, and companion animal programming to client residents. The Department of Veterinary Medicine, uh, Preventive Medicine, and 4-H Student Livestock Project Education. He is a proud member of Buckeye Nation as a 1996 grad of the OSU College of Veterinary Medicine. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. McDermott. Thanks, Bailey. As an alumnus and donor to CFAES, it is a pleasure to be here. Welcome everyone to this gardening webinar where we're gonna focus on summer veggies, especially what to plant now, right now. So first, before we get started, OH, I heard you. I heard you all. So when I am talking to a potential new audience, I always like to introduce Extension. I'm a member of Extension, and what Extension is, is we are the outreach arm of the university. We radiate the knowledge and research of the university to all Ohioans satisfying our land-grant mission. So I work in Franklin County, but if you are in a different county in Ohio, you can find your Extension educator to help you with your questions by looking up countyname.osu.edu. So if you're in Cuyahoga, that's cuyahoga.osu.edu. And if you are joining us from some other place in the United States or even globally, um, well, at least in the United States, there's a land grant in all 50 states. And so you always have support, but feel free to hit up OSU extension if you have questions that way. So we are gonna talk about what to plant now. And when we plant, keep this in mind, plants live in the soil. Plants have their roots in the soil when we do transplants and when we put seeds and we put it in the soil. So while we like to monitor our air temperatures for plant sake, we like to monitor our soil temperatures and we monitor it in the seed zone and in the transplant zone. So this is a slide from the beginning of the month. And if you guys remember the beginning of the month was cold. It was amazingly cold, but I saw a lot of people planting. And so this is a video, this is actually a video that I took in COVID year, but the temperatures were the same. And you're looking at this and thinking, Tim, this looks freezing cold and horrible. This was COVID year, and this was the second or third week in May. Look at how many leaves are on the trees. The problem that we have is when you are planting your summer veggies, if you plant them too early, like what happened with these tomatoes, if the soil temperature has not warmed up to the level that it needs to be to optimally start a seed or put a transplant in, you can have tremendous problems. When we talk about our cool season veggies like lettuces or kale or spinach, they actually prefer cooler soil to germinate. And if it's too hot, they won't. But if you put a tomato in the ground before that soil has warmed up to minimum 60, I like it better to 70, what happens is those plants don't do well. And in fact, what this is, is a picture of a tomato that was planted the beginning of the month. And you can see it's starting to turn funny colors. A little tiny bit of purple on the bottom. I don't mind too 
too, too much, a little bit, but this much, and especially this much, this is a tomato that is having serious problems. So where are we at now? We are perfect. So I took this a couple of days ago, and when we measure soil temperature, I have the luxury of working on a research farm here at Waterman Farm. They measure soil temperature every day because we need to know what those temps are. But depending on where you grow, if you need to know your soil temperature, you go ahead and take a digital thermometer and just put it in the soil. This is measured at basically two inches and four inches deep in transplant or seed zone. I love when it gets above 60 degrees. We have had some really, really nice weather. But if you don't know what your soil temp is at your location, just take a measurement on it and realize that it really is dependent on where you are individually in terms of your garden soil temperatures. So this might be where my garden is here at Waterman Farm, but I have some raised beds here at Waterman Farm and they are going to be a few degrees warmer simply because they're elevated and they catch a little more sunlight. But in my community garden, and that's where I showed you that video, I'll bet you my soil is a few degrees colder because that community garden is at the bottom of a hill, which means that cold air flows down into it at night. It is a frost zone. It's in a floodplain. And so my soil temperatures are cooler than that. But if you are checking, make sure before you start putting your summer veggies in the ground, it's above 60. And I like it above 65, getting close to 70, especially if I'm getting ready to put my tomatoes in. Right now, for most of uh, central Ohio, we are looking great. And um, I think that, you know, you might be a little bit behind if you're up by the lake. And if you're down south, you're probably even further advanced. Okay, and then as I plant and make my plans going forward, I like to check our weather. And this is the most interesting sl uh, slide to me because when I go on the National Weather Service or NOAA weather radar, I look to see where they're progressing in their predictions for Ohio. And this is a temperature and this is a moisture predictor. And this is the one month. And this is the most interesting thing. They, I've never seen this. They actually said Ohio has an equal chance of being warmer or colder and an equal chance of being uh, drier or moister. Normally we pick sides. So here in June in Ohio, we get to have a normal June, whatever the heck that means. When we look at our three month, this is what we're looking at for the summer. For most of June, it is looking to be about average percentage chances for normal temperature. And then pretty much all of Ohio has an above average chance of extra rainfall. Depending on where you are located in the United States, you can take a look at this. And the reason I put this up and what I like to look at it for is to make my plans going forward on what I want to plant. Because I'm a veggie grower and I like to plant plant for production. I like to cook, so I like to grow. I harvest and and I like to make sure that I am maximizing the production of what I get out of my community garden. A lot of that is planting. A good chunk of our summer veggies that we plant are going to be there for a while, and I need to really pay attention to what's coming my way. And then when I take a look at this and I see for summer veggies that there's a good chance we're going to have a wet summer. That makes me start thinking of summer humidity and summer humidity on summer veggies makes me start thinking about fungal disease. And so this tells me I need to make sure that my scouting for fungal disease is going to be rock solid because if I want to do anything about it, I need to make sure that I implement corrective changes as early as I can. All right, so let's talk about vegetable families for a second, because most of these have members that we're going to plant in summer, plant here shortly, and I want to make sure that I'm practicing my good crop rotation, meaning that I try not to plant veggies from these families in the same location, ideally having a three-year chunk of time between them, because if I plant them over and over in the same space year after year, what I'm doing is actually selecting for pests, weeds, disease, things like that. But if you don't have a ton of space, and I know a lot of folks don't, if I'm prioritizing my families that I need to do my crop rotation on, I'm really prioritizing my solanaceae, my nightshades, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, taters. I'm prioritizing my brassicas. They get lots of insects that like to chew on them. And then my cucurbits, they also have lots of insects. Those are the big three that I want to make sure that I do my, um, my crop rotation on in my veggie families. If you can't do that, 
you know, you have lots of tools in your toolbox that you can work with, but if you have the ability to do that, that's going to go a long way, believe it or not, in preventing disease and pests and weeds affecting your veggies. Okay, let's start with tomato veggie number one with a bullet. That is tomatoes. Everybody likes to grow and everybody likes to enjoy tomatoes for the most part. I grow them year after year. I used to grow tons of them and now I grow less, but I grow them smarter, not harder. I grow with very tall support. I grow mostly indeterminates. I like to do a mix of a few heirlooms, some resistant variety and hybrids in there. I like to throw a salad at tomato in there. I like to throw a cherry tomato in there. Mostly slicers and heirlooms, but a sprinkle of some snacking tomatoes as well. And my indeterminates, and what an indeterminate tomato is, is a variety that will continuously grow as a vine throughout the year. Here in my community garden, and you can see a picture of my tomato trellis, full sun, I am gonna match my fertility to the needs of that tomato, and they're going to get 10 feet tall. That is an eight foot cattle panel. I would say that there's a couple mistakes that folks make when they plant tomatoes that will not give you the production you want. One of them is not trellising them as tall as they like to get. And then I like to make sure that I address fertility, and we're going to talk about that. And then tomatoes are really interesting in that they will grow what's known as adventitious roots meaning that you can actually plant a tomato plant deeper than what it came in the pot. And for most veggies, you can't do that. If you bury the stem on a lot of veggies, it might get diseased, but tomatoes are going to grow extra roots. So I like to plant them deeply. I'm going to basically dig a, a hole that's at least a foot deep. I'm going to pick a bunch of the lower leaves off my tomatoes, and I'm going to plant them all the way deep, and then I'm going to mulch heavily. I use a mixture of plasticulture mulch right here. This is Sunbelt landscape fabric on my pathways to get rid of my weeds, and then I do a lot of organic mulch like a hay, which is what you see here, maybe straw. That is going to cool the soil, smother weeds, and that is going to put a little bit of a mechanical barrier from the fungal spores that are in the soil and those tomato leaves so that it slows the progression of fungal disease. And like I said, because I'm planting deep, I need to check my soil temperature because it might be 65 degrees, two inches deep, but I'm going 12 inches down. And that means I need to check the soil temp at the bottom. A lot of times what I'll do to make sure it's warm at the bottom is I'll dig my hole like the day before, and then it gets warm all the way down to the bottom. And then we could talk about tomatoes for a long time. In fact, I have a whole tomatoes 101 webinar on growing Franklin, which is the website I do for Franklin County. But what I think is very important that when you trellis your tomatoes, be very intention intentional on how you're going to prune them, whatever your method is. You could do a single leader up a stake or a dropped wire. You can do the Florida weave method. What I do is I grow mine on um, cattle panel trellis, and that gets them eight feet tall. And then I prune mine to a double leader, which means I have the main stem and then I have a sucker that I will train as a main stem. It's not usually my first sucker. It's usually about six or eight inches, maybe even a foot up. And then I'm always pruning out any leaves like these ones that are showing signs of disease. These need to be pruned out with sterilized pruners. And then after I harvest, I prune everything under the harvest. I really want that air circulation to be able to move through the tomato plant and the can especially when I look at that weather prediction that says I might have a little bit of a moist summer and that it might end up with a high humidity and that may end up or will end up with fungal disease on my tomatoes. And so that's something really important to keep in mind. Make sure for your tomatoes for success, trellis them tall, mulch them deep, and then do a good job with pruning. Make sure you sterilize your pruner so you don't spread those fungal spores or disease between your plants. All right. Another plant that you can get in the ground right now would be onions, and that's depending on where you're growing. But it is too late to start onions from seed right now. And I'm talking bulb onions. You could still plant green onions or, or bunching onions from seed right now. If you want to get onions in the ground, I would have recommended you planted them a little bit earlier, but if you got a little bit of space, go for it. The ones that I recommend you would do is called long day onions. We are in Ohio. We're in the Northern Hemisphere. Long day onions do best here. 
Your other choices would be day neutral, which do OK, and short day, which are designed more for a southern plant. And the difference between the long day and the short day is here in Ohio, we have lengthening daylight. It's happening right now. We're moving towards a really long, sunny summer day. Once we get to that June 21st time, we're going to have 16 hours of sun. In a long day onion, that increasing sun is what induces it to form that nice big bulb. You got two choices at the nursery right now. You have sets, which is those mini onion bulbs. You have transplants, which basically is a gum band around some spindly looking onion plants. Get them both in the ground as soon as you can. Water them deep. Make sure you address your fertility. Um, but make sure that when you are buying them on the package, it says long day onions. And I still think you're going to have a good chance of getting some onions. And uh, I'm plugging onions right now because, quite honestly, they're my favorite vegetable to grow in the garden, which I know sounds a little bit weird. But I grow pretty interesting uh, heirloom onions, and uh, I got mine in the ground a few weeks ago, and I'm really excited about them. All right, so the brassica family, cruciferous vegetables, monster family, lots and lots of veggies in there. Not what I would say you're going to be planting now for summer, but they're in harvest and in management right now. And they're really interesting family to me because they're so big and they're so interesting because you can grow them all 12 months, all four seasons of the year. And depending on which vegetable we're talking about, you eat the heads, the leaves, the roots, the stems. You know, a broccoli floret that you eat is the unopened flowers. So most of them are edible up and down the plant. Some of them you grow and harvest them entirely. Some of them you harvest leaves or take pieces off them over a long time period. Right now, you need to be scouting them very, very carefully because they get a whole bunch of pests, which we're going to talk about. They don't generally have pollinator worries because, for the most part, they're cool season veggies and we eat them before they go to flower. But be very careful because you want to be um, minding if you do any pesticide applications for some of the bugs we're going to talk about that you're reading, understanding, and following the label because the label is the law. But you need to know what that post-harvest interval is and how many times you can spray in order to control some of the bugs that love to eat brassicas because they're just so darn healthy. The biggest one that causes the most grief and that I get so many questions about is this one right here. This is the cabbage white butterfly, which is the most common butterfly in Ohio, an invasive. And then this is its baby right here, the imported cabbage worm. Nice camouflage. And these little babies can eat an enormous amount of your cruciferous vegetables. And what mama does is she takes her little ovipositor and she sticks one egg on, say, a, a you know, a, a cabbage leaf or a broccoli leaf. And then when this hungry, hungry caterpillar hatches, it starts eating into your brassicas because while she is a pollinator and she'll pollinate certain veggies, her forage food for her babies is the brassica family and they will eat and eat and eat and then they will make a mess of your plants as well. There's some great products out there. Any product that has spinosad labeled for use for this predator is very effective. Um, scouting is very effective. Make sure you're checking frequently because while these eggs are very, very tiny, by the time the little caterpillar gets huge, it is eating a monster amount of your, your plants. All right. Let's see where we're at with our Q&A and chat. Nothing yet. I will have time for some questions. Maybe uh, unless you have something that's really topical but for what we're talking about this second, save up your questions. And when we get close to the end, I'll make sure I save some time that we can answer some questions. All right, the cucurbit family, another monster family. This is a family that besides having cucumbers, it also has your summer squash like your zucchini and yellow squash. It has your winter squash like your butternuts or your hubbards. It has pumpkins. It has gourds. It also has your vining fruit like your watermelon, your cantaloupe, and your honeydew. And these are ones that uh, really are a wonderful part of the summer garden. And right now is a great time to plant. But Boy, these are plagued by bugs. There is no family of vegetables that I plant myself or deal with in terms of client questions 
where I get more of them than the cucurbit family. Because most of the most common varieties that you're going to buy and plant in your garden are going to be dioecious and they're going to have male and female flowers. So they are very pollinator dependent. And the bugs that plague these are hard to kill. So if you're going to use any kind of pesticides, they have to be labeled for the bugs that you're targeting on this veggie family. And then you have to mind the label very carefully because nearly all of them are going to have what's known as the B label. And the B label gives you instructions to make sure that you are not negatively impacting pollinators. So when you plant, you can plant in a couple different ways. You can direct seed these. They're generally pretty big seeds and they have good germination. You can start them. Um, I have seen on the internet, and I don't really know why, but the internet tells me I need to plant these in hills. And I honestly, I don't. I actually plant them almost in a shallow trough um, because I want to make sure that I get a lot of water delivered to these very thirsty plants. Most of the cucurbits are a huge bags of water. So I don't plant in hills because I don't want the water to run off around. Um, and then I make sure that I am watering them appropriately. And then I like to mulch them as well because mulch keeps the soil cool around those plants, which allows them to more efficiently take up moisture out of the soil. And then I plant them a bunch of different times. And so, you know, when, when I get questions about these guys, first off, here's one question I get. And that is when I say that they have male and female flowers, a lot of people ask me and they're like, well, what do you mean by that? Well, basically with these cucurbits, you have a male flower and a male flower is this guy right here. This is just a stem into a flower. And then a female flower has the baby vegetable with a flower on the top, right? So a pollinator goes in the male, picks up pollinate, pollen goes in the female and pollinates it. And then that results in a fruit. They're very tiny when they are just babies before the flower has opened. So these are actually two little female zucchini. And what happens is generally with the cucurbits, they throw a few male flowers out first to attract the pollinators, and then they will put out some female flowers once they have pollinators around in order to get a successful harvest. But that's also when the bugs are out. Any minute, if they have not already erupted in Ohio, is going to be these guys. Probably the worst bug in my garden, that is cucumber beetles. Because what they will do is they will vector a bacterial organism called Erwinia that is going to cause a infection that affects the vasculature of cucur cucurbit plants and it can kill that plant pretty quick within a few days once it manifests and usually it starts to affect the plant right when the plant is actively moving a lot of fluid to ripen fruit so you want to ideally try to keep these plants from getting affected by cucumber beetles but that is really easily said and, and hard to do. Honestly, I have found my most effective strategy that I use with my cucumber cucurbit plants, um, and that could be cucumbers or zucchini. Usually my summer squash are more affected um, by cucumber beetles and say my butternuts, but at least when they're baby plants, I treat them the same way. And that is, I will put seeds or transplants out and then i like to cover them with insect netting over a low tunnel which is basically some hoops over the ground and then i keep them under that low tunnel protected from the bad bugs until i see the male flowers coming out before i open up that canopy um, and that keeps the baby plants from getting chewed on and hopefully preventing a lot of the different problems with the bacterial infection plus it's nice protection against squash bugs and squash vine borers and, and all the other things that seem to absolutely devastate these guys they, uh, the cucumber beetles come in two different um, species, and, and actually these are totally different genus. You have the spotted, and then you have the striped. I usually see the striped earlier, and I see more of them. They feed on all parts of the plant. They feed on the roots and the leaves and the flowers and the stems and the fruit, and they can just absolutely devastate it. They are emerging here shortly. These beetles overwinter, and what happens in the spring is the overwintered adults emerge, land on your baby cucurbits, chew them to bits, lay their eggs in the soil around whatever is remaining, and then those babies hatch, chew on the roots, and then emerge, fly out, and start 
eaten the rest of your plants in there. So be very mindful of your control of these because they are a problem. In fact, they're such a problem. We do what's known as scouting. Scouting means we look to see if we notice any of the bad bugs showing up. And these are truly bad bugs. The scouting threshold limit for uh, cucumber beetles is either one or even one half of a bug per plant before you got a problem on there. And I agree. Now, what you need to do, and these ones are easy to figure out, that these are your problems that are out there, but we see lots of different bugs in our gardens as we're working in our gardens, and not every bug is a bad bug. Some bugs are beneficial. Every bad bug that's in your garden has a good bug that wants to eat it as food, and so another reason we like to identify and, and do smart use of any applications of pesticides is we want to preserve our good bugs while making sure that we are minimizing the damage by our bad bugs. And so I like to increase my biodiversity. I like to plant some flowers in there. Um, I like to make sure that I have some, you know, different things growing so that I can encourage my good bugs. And so, you know, when we talk about different bugs that are in our gardens, this guy right here, this cute little critter fuzzy thing, the wolf spider, it is actually a preferential feeder on cucumber beetles. Um, spiders would be considered generalists and they eat lots of things, but I've seen some research that says most spiders eat more bad bugs than they eat good bugs. Now, I'm not a huge fan of uh, you know, sprinkling a bunch of wolf spiders in my cucurbit patch. But if I see a spider in there, I'm not going to kill them just because, because they are likely doing a lot more good than harm. And I need all the allies in my garden I can get. Here's another one that is going to be coming soon. I see this emerge after the cucumber beetles. This is the squash bug. It is related to the stink bug. You can see it kind of looks like a skinny stink bug. They're cousins. And what this does is it lays these egg clusters. They start white and rapidly bronze, usually on the underside of a leaf, not the oldest leaves not the youngest leaves. I see them on sort of the healthy mature leaves and they'll lay them in clusters of eggs uh, and mama will lay a bunch of clusters and then they hatch. And then you have these larval forms and nymphal forms that mature and then they're mobile. So they're running all over the place and then they lay more eggs. And so you can have a really healthy looking plant and then you can get some egg clusters. And if you're not paying attention, you will have a lot of bugs really, really fast. And once they're infested, there's very little you can do. My preferred method of control for the squash bug is to do heavy scouting for these egg clusters. And then what I do is I don't scrape them off because I don't want them to hatch in my patch. I actually put my thumb over that and rip this whole piece of leaf off and get it out of the garden. And I'll check or try to check all of my cucumber, uh, cucurbit plantings, especially my zucchini every other day because since I can't do a lot of spraying, I, I need to use the other components of my integrated pest management strategy, which scouting is a huge one. Okay, other pests in my garden and likely in your garden, and I just got back from being out of town for 10 days, my garden is full of weeds right now. So how do we control weeds in the garden? You have lots of different methods. Your easiest thing to keep in mind for your weed control, what a farmer does is don't let them go to seed, okay? We have annual weeds, we have perennial weeds. Annual weeds grow once each year, basically the seed sprouts, and then you'll get some vegetative growth, and then it turns reproductive, and it throws the stem up, and then it puts a flower out and gets pollinated, and then you get seeds, and they can seed like mad. Certain weeds that you have in your garden will produce upwards of 100,000 seeds per plant. That is a lot of weeding. Don't let your annuals go to seed. Once they start to sprout, I like to knock them down. I can mow them. I can weed whack them. I can take a hoe to them. Perennials, they will spread by seed. Sometimes they spray, uh, spread by runners or, or rhizomes. Again, don't let them go to seed. You might not kill them when you knock them down because they're perennials, but you'll weaken them over time. This is actually a picture from my community garden. So I garden at Wallace Community Gardens. I am in my 27th year. Wallace is an actual victory garden, one of three remaining originals in the United States, but it's been growing weeds since 1942. And if you think about all the weeds that have gone to seed, this is a representative sample from my next door neighbor's plot about Six months, six weeks 
after they first plowed, we got good rain and good heat, and I will have weeds that grow two, three feet tall in a heavy duty cluster. And you can see the Pennsylvania smartweed down here is going to seed. You can see this thistle starting to go to seed. These need knocked down. Hopefully your garden looks way different than mine, but mine is a who's who of all the worst weeds in the world, which is why I mulch heavily because weeding is literally my least favorite thing to do in my garden and probably in yours too. All right. We talked about good bug or bad bug a second ago with the wolf spider. Now, you can have presentations for good and bad bugs that look different than you think. So on the left is a tomato hornworm. I, it might be a tobacco hornworm, um, but they do the same thing, and that is they eat insane amounts of your tomato plants. And then on this one is the same critter, but what it looks like is it has these white things, which are cocoons of a beneficial insect. So I took this guy off a tomato plant and, and put him on the fence post for a picture. They don't pose like that. Normally they would be eating your tomatoes down to the ground. But when I saw this guy, I knew that while the one here on the left I would kill that guy because he is a bad bug and he has no control measures. This one is no longer a threat. It has been completely paralyzed. The good bug, which is a, um, a beneficial wasp, has laid babies on here, and now we have babies in cocoons. They paralyzed this rascal. When they hatch, they're going to fly out, and look at all of these friends of the garden are going to fly into your garden looking for other hornworms to paralyze. So bad bug over here, but this is now a cluster of good bugs. And so, you know, when you are working in your garden, and I get these questions all the time, people will say to me, Tim, I got bugs in my garden, what do I spray? And I say, well, you know, you have to identify them first. One, because you want to make sure that they're a bad bug, not a good bug. But the second reason is, is quite honestly, there is no one thing that gets all of them. And especially if you have pollinators there, you have those worries. And the label will tell you what you can do, when you can do it, and how many times, and how to do it safely with your PPE, and then how long you have to wait until it is safe to eat your veggies. So read, understand, and follow that label after you've identified your bug. And then some of you might have seen this. It's one of my favorite videos. I took this on a farm in Madison County. And so here is that tomato hornworm. And take a look at the exquisite camouflage that this rascal has, right? You can see it right here. This is on cherry tomatoes. This was a half acre field that the grower would grow cherry tomatoes and sell them to grocery stores. And we noticed he had some hornworm damage in there. And this guy's big. This is big as your finger. This is like three or four inches long. They are a hungry, hunger caterpillar, and they will eat half of a whole tomato plant as they mature. This guy had trained his black Labrador named Reggie to take care of the plant. So I saw Reggie walking by, and I just had to point that out. And when Reggie saw that snack, he is the ultimate in integrated pest management. Look at that. He didn't even disturb that plant. He didn't even knock the tomatoes off there. That's a good dog right there. Okay. One of the other major questions that I get about when people send me pictures or they're saying, Tim, I'm just not getting the veggies that I want to get is because they're not matching the fertility of what they're growing to what that plant needs to thrive and produce. If you think about a tomato, you plant those in May, you harvest them all the way throughout the summer. My tomatoes are going to get 10 foot tall, and I'm going to hopefully get hundreds of tomatoes off them. That is a tremendous amount of fertility that I am pulling out out of the soil. I need to make sure that I have that fertility in the soil and I have it for the entire time. I like to soil test to make sure that I'm doing that. This is the top half of a soil test that I took in the Shepherd neighborhood of Columbus over on the east side and you can see that some of these macro my, my, some of these macronutrients that are needed for plant growth, phosphorus and potassium, are below optimum range. You can't tell by looking. I needed to test to see this. If I would have planted my tomatoes in this ground, they wouldn't have done anything. They would have basically started to grow, stopped because these nutrients are rate limiting. And then they would have started turning funny colors, and then the weeds would have overtaken them. And instead of having a great year, I would have had nothing, and it would have been very disappointing. So soil test allowed me to see that I needed to address these nutrients. It gave me recommendations. Generally, I use two different kinds of fertilizer. I'll use an 
granular fertilizer over here. Granular fertilizers incorporated in the soil are top dressed, are labeled to feed for two to three months. I might need to feed more, right? If I feed my tomatoes in May and that's maybe two to three months, that's June, July, maybe around August, that's when my tomato plants are huge and I'm supposed to be harvesting a ton. I probably need to fertilize again to get them all the way through August, September, and hopefully into October. If I'm feeding with uh, a water-soluble fertilizer, usually the label says every one to two weeks. That's a good thing for a faster planting like a lettuce or maybe something in a container. Um, but then I need to make sure that I'm paying attention in case I have heavy rainfall for both of these because, you know, if I get heavy air rainfall, that might drive my water-soluble right out of the soil profile and it might decrease my uh, granulars ability to feed from two to three months to maybe one to two months. And so I'm always kind of evaluating my system as I go. Key takeaways for this are, if you don't know your soil's fertility already, consider doing a soil test that will give you the guidance to make sure that you get your best harvest this summer. And I highly recommend it. Best money you will spend. All right. I've been gabbing for a long time. Let's talk about what to plant now. So my soil temperature, I know what it is, and it is optimal for summer plantings. If you don't know, know yours, check it. But I'll tell you what, I need to plant. I need to get every summer thing in the ground. I have already planted my peppers. I got my onions in. I've got some green beans started. I need to go big on my tomatoes. They're on my desk right now. Actually, I'm looking at them. They're under the lights. Uh, they're getting hardened off. I've started some sweet potatoes that I need to get in the ground. And um, this Memorial Day holiday weekend, I think I'm gonna be spending a bunch of my time getting stuff in the ground. Tomatoes and peppers start, you know, by planting those as transplants, too late to start those as seeds. Same with your eggplant. Potatoes are planted as seed potatoes. I like to do green beans from seed. Sweet corn, get it in the ground right now. Um, for that harvest later on. Basil can be started as a transplant or outside. Collards and mustards, those are your leafy brassicas. Go right ahead and, and start those as well. Still a bunch of transplants that you can get and put in the ground out there. I start my okra from seed, and then we talked about the cucurbits. Get them out, but make sure you are doing your protection. I highly recommend some sort of protection and I'm a big fan now in a, an insect mesh. They do uh, these nice little insect meshes that I can put right over a low tunnel and that puts protection for my baby plants from those um, bugs that wanna eat my food. Then I like to do sequential planting. And sequential planting means I don't just plant something once for the entire year in terms of certain vegetable varieties. For my cool season veggies, I like to sequentially plant lettuce, carrots, radish, maybe even some spinach, um, meaning that instead of planting a ton of radishes, I'm going to plant a short little patch or, you know, tiny patch or short row every two weeks. Would I plant radishes right now? Maybe, probably up north if my soil's cooler. Um, I done with my plantings of radishes. I did three radish plantings this year, and I have some radishes in the ground, but I like a lot of the different brassicas. Radishes can be a little bitter if they uh, are harvested when it's hot outside, even a little spicy, and so probably late for that. But in terms of my summer veggies, I will plant green beans at least three times with a very similar thing. Instead of having one huge patch of green beans that is going to grow with a big harvest all at once, I like eating green beans all summer. And In fact, I will do a last planting all the way in August and eat green beans all the way as late as Halloween. Same with cucumbers, same with zucchini. I like to get my plantings about two or three of them because I worry that the cucumber beetles are going to munch them down to the ground. Each time I plant them, I do the protection on them as best I can. And then again, I follow up with a late planting close to August 1st, and then I can protect it until the cool weather gets here. And maybe the bugs will go to their overwintered homes and I'll get lucky and get a fall harvest without a bunch of bugs. And then I like to plant basil at least three times a year. I get a lot of clients and they send me pictures of their basil and basil's an annual. So when it grows, it's going to grow vegetative and then you're eating delicious basil and make sure you're harvesting aggressively. But then as that annual wants to move through its life cycle, it starts to put flowers and the leaves get really tiny. Instead of trying to save it and chop at it, just plant some more basil. 
tons of seed in that pack. I always like to have the really tender big leaf basil um, in harvest. And so I'll plant it several times during the year. And, and that way I'm always having a stream of it. When mine starts to go to seed, then I let it. Um, or I'll put it in the compost pile at that point. It has completed its life cycle. So what about these, Tim? I have some a list of different plants out here. And so if we go through these, what brassicas would I plant right now? I would probably still do Brussels sprouts in the ground right now in terms of our head brassicas. Maybe cabbage if it was a fast variety. Probably not cauliflower and probably not broccoli. When I looked at my monthly projections, you know, we, we looked at June and it wasn't supposed to be necessarily too hot. I've seen some 90 degrees coming up in early June here. Brassicas like the cool weather to mature. I would not plant spinach outside. Soil's too warm. Spinach is a finicky germinator. Now that's me at my space. If you measured the temperature where you're at, because you might be in a totally different situation, then I would consider planting these, right? It comes down to that soil temperature that we talked about. Carrots you could plant right now. Not a problem. They take a long time to germinate and we're gonna have some hot weather and you're gonna need to keep those seeds moist so it might be tricky. Beets and Swiss chard are in the same family and they um, will germinate at a wide variety of temperatures. So you can go ahead and plant that. Kale, um, kale grows pretty much 12 months out of the year. Now I like cool season kale way better than warm season kale, but it's such a versatile plant. Um, I would still plant kale if you are a kale lover. Just keep in mind, brassica, cucumber or cabbage white butterfly imported cabbage worm will eat your kale and so scout 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 for that all right so i showed you the picture of the cold in my garden at wallace community gardens this is the exact same garden path and this is covid again but as we start to think about what the summer garden looks like um, you know, right now my garden is early on in the season and pretty soon we are going to be in heavy harvest and everything's going to be looking great. I thought I would just show you a picture of Wallace Community Gardens. Like I said, one of three original victory gardens in the United States. And the sunflowers that you see here are a big draw for a lot of visitors who come to our garden. They are naturalized weeds. They are the 12, 13 foot tall sunflowers. They come up all over the garden each year. The birds spread the seeds everywhere. And most people will leave a plant or two go up because they're a nice little um, pollinator attractor and they're a really nice um, uh, plant that you can uh, have just to have in your garden uh, as a cut flower. And they attract a ton of people to come down and take a bunch of pictures at my garden. And so that is Wallace Community Gardens. You're welcome to visit. It is a public park. Uh, just be mindful of everybody's plantings there. On that note, before we get into questions, I know that uh, Bailey and the crew have some uh, some bookkeeping uh, and housekeeping stuff that they want to go in, and then I'll stick around a few minutes for some questions um, before we finish. Yes, thank you. Thank you again, Dr. McDermott, for sharing your gardening knowledge. It's been such a pleasure to learn from you uh, as well. Um, so just, just thank you so much for, for hosting the webinar. And thanks everyone else for joining us today. We're going to send, um, basically, I'll send in a chat here about where you can find uh, the recording for the session. It'll be on the advancement website, but otherwise, feel free to ask questions and continue uh, that conversation with Dr. Herbert Dormant to finish up our webinar here. All right, gang. So why don't you dump questions in the Q&A and then um, if my crew uh, can help after I answer one, if they can just make it kind of go away. Um, then we will go there. So John asks, I was told many years ago that basil and marigolds are good control, are good insect control in the tomato patch. Is that true? So John, I just did probably a, a few weeks ago, a companion planting webinar and um, companion planting is a really interesting thing. I get tons and tons of questions on it. And unfortunately, a tremendous amount of what has been postulated doesn't have research to back it up. Now that, that doesn't mean it's not, um, it is not something that is, incorrect because it just means that they haven't had research done on it. But we've seen so much anecdotal evidence that proves that there's some positive things that I don't dismiss it. Now, in the evidence of marigolds, marigolds do have a little bit of a beneficial effect by having allelopathic negative impacts on some nematodes that can cause problems with tomatoes. Where we have seen some other benefits with marigolds um, is 
planted among cucurbits, they have had uh, the negative impact on some cucumber beetles. And so uh, I, I do believe, here's how I do mine. I interplant a bunch of different plants within my veggie garden, increasing my biodiversity because I like to provide lots of different pollinator habitat and lots of bit lots of different beneficial habitat. So I do think that planting marigolds or basil or things like that have been good things um, for my garden. And I recommend you do that. So anonymous attendee says, how do you feel about protecting the moths that the caterpillars go into? Carolina Sphinx and the five spotted hawk moth. We have seen several talks and webinars from Jim McCormick. So um, yes, the 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 tomato hornworm grows into a nice big whopping beautiful moth and um the i guess the way i feel about it is i don't like them eating my veggies and so i am going to control ones that eat my veggies protecting as many of them as i can and i'll give you another example besides that one you know when we talk about monarchs we um, were easily able to protect monarchs because the forage food that baby monarch caterpillars feed on is the milkweed family. And the milkweed family is a um, basically poisonous to humans, companion animals, and livestock. When we talk about, say, the swallowtail butterfly, which is another giant, beautiful butterfly, their forage family is actually umbelliferae or APACA vegetables and herbs. And so they will graze a tremendous amount of my um, you know, things like your dill and your parsley and your carrots, they'll just eat them down to the ground. And so it's a delicate balancing act in the vegetable garden in order to protect those beautiful moss and butterflies and valuable pollinators and yet keep them from eating my food. What I do for the swallowtails is I plant extra and um, I will let some live away from my mass plantings and um, and then I'll control the ones that are affecting my uh, my priority plantings. I don't plant very many tomatoes and so I don't have um, enough that I would share those with the other veggies, but I think it's a good idea in order for us to do so. I've not found that I've had a big problem um, with those pollinators uh, affecting my tomatoes to where I would do anything aggressive like spraying or anything like that. I try to make sure if I'm doing control, it is mild control. So Lauren asks, we have added boxes for a flower cutting garden next to our vegetables this year. Any suggestions on flowers would be appreciated. Oh, okay. My wife does cut flowers and I wish I knew all the different varieties that are out there. So Lauren, here is what I recommend that you do. I would say evaluate your sun and then look for annuals that would be long stem for cut flowers. So if you are a sun lover, uh, or, I mean, if, you're, if you have a ton of sun in your veggie garden, uh, or where you're going to do your cut flowers, then you know you have so many different things that you can plant. Easy ones for a person who's just getting started, I would say, would be sunflowers, zinnias, and marigolds, especially the longer stem non-dwarf marigolds. But boy, there is a ton of amazing cut flowers out there. Just make sure that you pick your variety according to the sun in the space, and, and that will allow you to get full um, harvest of your cut tomatoes. So Robert asks, my grandfather used to plant tomatoes with the roots sideways underground claiming it led to healthier fruit. Have you ever tried this tactic results? Yes. So Robert, your grandfather was using a very similar um, way to plant that I do when I plant mine deeply. What people will do is instead of planting them deeply because it's too maybe cold down in the bottom of the hole. People will plant a trough and then plant their tomatoes sideways in order to get as much stem buried under the soil, which will have more interstitial root growth, which will result in a larger and more vibrant root ball for the tomato. And since plants take up their nutrients and their water and oxygen through their roots, a large root ball that is viable um, is going to make a healthier plant and a healthier harvest. So anonymous attendee says, how long can tomato seeds pre be preserved? I would say maximum would be three years for tomato seeds. Each one of the different veggies that we grow, there are different seed viability times based on variety. Tomatoes, I try to use my seed within two years. I think you can go as long as three. Different things uh, in terms of varieties that might not last that long, like the onion family, you need to buy new seeds every single year. They um, are good for one year. I like to do lettuce two years maximum. Um, my beans and my peas, I've had good germination success with seed as old as four years, believe it or not. 
Joan asked, do you recommend neem oil for pests or fungus? So uh, Joan, I would recommend neem oil for certain pests, uh, using it as uh, according to the label, and the label has to say that it is for that certain pest and has applicability for it. I don't generally use neem oil for fungal infections. Um, they're going to require a fungicide, um, but I've had some success with neem oil used appropriately. Anonymous attendee says tips related to deer and or rabbits. So I have found that the insect barrier that I mentioned or low uh, tunnel row cover is okay protection for deer and rabbits. I use a fence in my community garden. I believe it or not, truck down a seven foot deer fence in my community garden patch. I have a huge community garden patch because it is a victory garden. But if I don't protect it from deer and rabbits, they will eat all my food. In urban environments, nuisance wildlife is absolutely um, high on the problem scale. It, I get so many questions for it, and there's just so little that you can do. The most effective that you can do for your veggies is fencing. Um, I will use like a deer fence, uh, it, and you got to make sure that you peg it down on the ground really tight so rabbits can't get under it. Seth says, we've created permanent raised beds that are 2.5 feet wide. How many rows of determinate Roma tomatoes and indeterminate Amish should I try to fit across the 2.5 feet of bed width? Two max. Honestly, two and a half feet wide for for me, I would probably put one down the middle or I might do a zigzag to try to offset them a little bit. And the reason is, Seth, that tomatoes are laterally rooted and so they're going to spread out um, in sort of a radius as opposed to really being tap rooted like a carrot or something like that. With a four foot wide raised bed, I do um, I do basically two in you know like two rows down the middle. But for two and a half, I would do one or I would do zigzag with them offset a little bit to try to fit an extra plant or two. Anonymous Stendi says, my beans get covered with Japanese beetles, what to do? Yes, so beans have a number of beetles that will feed on them. In fact, cucumber beetles will feed on beans. Uh, then you got bean beetles and you got Japanese beetles. I grow my beans under uh, insect mesh. They're actually planted under insect mesh right now already. I planted the seeds in the ground and I put the cover over them immediately because the beetles are going to come get them. And um, the other thing that I have found very effective for Japanese beetles is what's known as trap cropping. So Japanese beetles will eat lots of stuff. I don't like the uh, traps that will attract them in there. I find that they might attract more bugs that are in there. But one of the weeds that I showed you in the picture, and I mentioned it because its little tiny flower was going to flower, was Pennsylvania smartweed. And that seems to be Japanese beetles favorite food. And so I usually leave a little patch of that in my garden. And that is a trap crop, which means the beetles go and eat there first, which allows me to scout and see them coming. But then what I can do is all the beetles that come to that crop, I can kill by knocking them into a mason jar with soapy water and kill them before they get on my beans. Other than that, I like exclusion. Other than that, if you're going to spray your beans, you need to follow the label very, very carefully because you don't want to spray in flour um, if you're not spraying according to the bean, uh, to the label for the beetles. Anonymous Stendi says, doesn't the insect mesh block too much sun? I only have five to six hours of sun to worry about blocking too much using insect covers. I have found that the insect mesh blocks very little sun um, and doesn't really allow very much heat buildup. I find that it actually blocks less sun and builds up heat even less than the thinnest weight of row cover. But I guess I, I share your worry that even a little bit of sun with five to six hours can be problematic. What I would say is be very intentional about picking vegetable varieties that mature quickly so that you have your greatest chance of getting a harvest when you have um, a five to six hour sun time window. You're going to find really fast tomato varieties like cherries are better bets than, say, a big um, you know, heirloom slicer. Great questions, gang. We got time for one more.
All right. Well, I can tell you what my plans are this weekend. I've got my tomato trellis to put up. I got my tomatoes to put in the ground. I've got a million weeds that I need to control. I need to prep my bed to get ready to put in my um, zucchini. I can't wait to get those in the ground. I need to irrigate because it is dry here and we have had very little rain. So for me, it is going to be a busy week in the garden. Uh, I hope you guys get some garden week time in. Below you have my email. So if anybody has a question for me, feel free to email me at mcdermott.15 at osu.edu. If you're in a different county here in Ohio, um, you have an educator that is uh, ready to take your questions and would be delighted to assist you. You can find your educator's email at um, countyname.osu.edu. And thanks for the kind words.